I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're going to be discussing how to make your GitLab pipeline more secure by adding runtime AppSec observability. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that everyone has been muted. We will have a chance for Q&A at the end, and you can submit your questions by typing them into that Q&A box. We are recording this webinar, and so all registrants will receive an email with a link to the recording. And lastly, don't forget, please take our survey at the end of the webinar. Let us know how we did. And now I'll pass it off to Vikas, our product manager here at Deep Factor, to continue on. Hello, everyone. I'm Vikas. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm the product manager here at Deep Factor. And I'm joined today by my colleague and friend, uh, Darshan, who's a software architect. He handles uh, most of our back end uh, architecture. And before I hand over to uh, Darshan for the demo, I'd like to quickly talk a little bit about DevSecOps and show you guys what we're building uh, at DeFactor so you have some context. So we've spoken to a lot of customers, uh, different kinds uh, of, uh, of different sizes. And what we've noticed is they fall in one of these four stages in terms of their DevSecOps journey. Stage one is they have almost zero to minimal security checks during uh, development. These are very, um, these are in their nascent stages of uh, adding security in their uh, CICD pipeline. Stage two, uh, they have gated releases. So, so they do some amount of out of band testing. Uh, they, may, they may do some pen testing from time to time, but they don't have uh, security integrated into the CICD pipeline. Stage three, uh, we do see a lot of companies in stage two uh, and some companies have even progressed to stage three, which is basically they have some amount of uh, integration in their CI CD pipeline. They do some static uh, code analysis, they do some SAS analysis on each build, which is great, but we, we believe that that does not give you the full picture that you require to release uh, secure builds. And that's where uh, DeepFactor is working hard towards is building stage four, where you have continuous observability of each and every build. Uh, and we also look for runtime observability and not, not just static code analysis, right? So let's do a quick poll at this stage, right? Uh, where, where do you, in which stage do you think your company lies? Uh, uh, Amy, could you please uh, put up the poll? Yeah. So you all should be able to see the poll. Yeah, so please check all that apply. We actually have several customers who cross between uh, a couple of stages. They're not quite in one or the other. That's a good point, Amy. I think uh, uh, several companies have multiple teams and each team may be at uh, different stages of maturity. Right now, the majority of our audience is actually split between stage two and stage three. So let me give it just about 10 more seconds to make sure everybody could cast their vote. It is interesting to see that uh, that's the view that we've gotten from the existing customers as well. Uh, most customers lie in either stage two or three or two or five in some sense, going from stage two to stage three. Right, right. Well, it looks like everyone has cast their vote and it is the majority in stage three, but there is a, a good portion that's also in stage two. Nobody's in stage four. Right. And that's good. That's good. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's the stage four is the natural next step for all the guys in stage two and stage three. Right. Right. So as I was telling you, right, um, most of the security tools are, are, you know, concentrated on the static portion of DevSecOps. But there is really a runtime portion as well, right? Uh, you don't you don't buy a, a car that's lying in the in the lot. You want to test drive it, and that's where uh, Depactor comes in. We look at the runtime portion of your app. Uh, what code is getting executed? Is it secure? What library is being used? What OS package is being used? And how much of it is being used? So you know you get a lot of these runtime uh, portion of observability that you can complement with your static tools and you know, prioritize the alerts that you need to fix and even fix them easily using the runtime information that we provide. Uh, what I'll do now is I'll quickly show you the uh, Defector UI. So 
so as to give you a context of what, the kind of insights we provide. You guys should be able to see my portal UI in a bit. Okay, so uh, this is how the UI looks. Uh, if you look at this app, I just have a, a test app that's instrumented with Defector. Uh, we have about 50 security alerts, and these are the modules of insight you provide. System call risks. These are risks deep in your execution, right? Even if you're, uh, uh, say, writing a Java app or you're using a, a C app and you, you loaded a library, and that library is executing a, a vulnerable function, for example, STR copy or an M map, or, uh, and, and using it in a, a vulnerable way, we we uh, inform you that you know of such vulnerabilities, which I don't know if any other tools provide you that that level of observability. Next is behavior violations. Uh, so this is an interesting one. This gives the power uh, to the AppSec teams to put guardrails uh, for the application. So you can define what countries uh, uh, your application is allowed to talk to, what um, parts in, in, in your file system your uh, application is allowed to talk to, uh, from where should your processes be launched, right? So Anytime there is a violation of such behavior, you get alerted. Vulnerable OS packages. So uh, we look for uh, OS packages that are actually loaded by your application. So you may have installed other OS packages that are not loaded. We don't uh, we don't inform you that, right? We all we, we give you the uh, OS packages that are actually vulnerable and actually used. And this applies to your container images as well. Then vulnerable dependencies. So we, we tell you all the dependencies that you've added. It could be a jar that you imported, or it could be an NPM module. And we also tell you if they're vulnerable, along with usage information that helps you prioritize uh, which alerts you want to fix. And then dash scan. Uh, so we provide both web and API scans. Uh, we use OVA app scanner, but it's completely uh, embedded into the defector um, portal. So you can, you, can, you can launch a single kick scan and get results from your scans. Uh, let me show you a quick examples of the kind of alerts under each of these, uh, so you get an idea. Uh, as I was telling you, unsafe string API was used in this example, right? Some of you guys may know that SDR copy was deemed uh, vulnerable and there are safer alternatives, right? So we look for usages like this and we tell you, we give you a stack trace so you know where uh, that uh, that SDR copy, that vulnerable function is called, so you can quickly fix such occurrences. Uh, behavior violations. So if you look at this alert, it says a connection was made to a prohibited country, right? And how did we arrive at this alert? Uh, we arrived at this alert because you can set policies. And this is where the power is given to the AppSec teams or even the engineering managers, where they can decide to put guardrails around their application. So if you see, uh, I had set a policy which says alert on outgoing collection, uh, connection to selected countries, and I allowed only United States. So anything outside of the United States, you get alerted. And in this case, there was a connection made to Madagascar. Right? You want to be alerted for such um, occurrences and you want to find out if it was a legit outgoing connection or if it was a, a vulnerable outgoing connection. Vulnerable OS packages, so we, it, we give you the entire list of uh, uh, dependencies that were loaded and we also tell you all the SO files that were loaded by your application. Along with uh, CVE information, which we pull from the NVD database. Similarly, for dependencies, um, we do for uh, we provide for Node and Java at this point, and we are adding support for Python and Ruby as well. Uh, so you can see we we provide you uh, a, what kind of what kind of dependency it was, what is the license, what version of the dependency you're using, and what are the vulnerabilities that are associated with it. Dash looks for OWASP top ten sort of uh, alerts, right and I'm just taking an example to show you the kind of stuff that we do. Uh, so we club all the URIs associated with with, a, with an alert, so you it's easy for you to triage. You can you can quickly decide these two are 
not an issue, for example, right? And and you can always give a comment uh, that why this is not an issue, right? Um, another piece of uh, insight that we give you is born. Uh, uh, Biden uh, administration recently emphasized the importance of uh, software born for security. So you can quickly come here and get the list of all your dependencies, get the list of all your OS packages. And we also give you uh, runtime bomb. We also tell you the outgoing connections that your application is making. You can download, download it. Uh, you can share it with your uh, team, with your AppSec team, or with your compliance uh, team as well. Now, I, I'll just take another minute to show you how we how we are uh, arriving at these alerts. What's happening under the hood? So, if you look at this screen, we tell you the kind of information that you're collecting from your running application, right? We are looking at file events. We're looking at heartbeat. Heartbeat is 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 a regular event that we send with some stat data, which has you know what are the connections you made and what files you touched and whatnot, right? Memory warning events, package info events, and, and so on. So we are basically collecting all of this information from your running application, and that's how we are arriving at all of the, these rich alerts with the rich um, detailed information that will help you uh, triage and fix them. Yep, uh, this was a quick uh, uh, demo. So uh, now that I have um, set the context, I'll pass on the stage uh, to Darshan, uh, who will continue with the demo. Thanks, Darshan. All yours. Let me just pull up my screen. Oh, uh, I hope you guys can see my screen. So. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thanks for the introduction to the Defractor uh, platform, because uh, uh, having said that, uh, let's get started with uh, how to add runtime uh, observability into your GitLab pipeline. Uh, so for this demo, I'm going to use uh, an open source project. Uh, it's called a node code project. Uh, just hold on a second. Yeah, it's called the Node Code Project, uh, and it's by the OASP Foundation. Uh, it's normally used by a lot of these uh, security professionals for uh, learning about security, and it, it's it's an intentionally vulnerable uh, uh, project. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to have two. I'm going to demonstrate two uh, workflows. Uh, one is going to uh, show how you can actually. Uh, Add observability to your integration tests itself, uh, and then run a task scan. Uh, and the second workflow is going to be with containers. Uh, so uh, it's it's quite a normal workflow to be able to uh, uh, containerize your applications and actually deploy it in multiple environments. Uh, so we're going to show uh, both these scenarios, uh, and we're going to use the same project for both of them. Uh, so to start with. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview, this project is built in Node.js and it has a MongoDB backend. Uh, so it's it's a functional application, and uh, this is uh, probably a, a standard uh, pipeline. Uh, let me just run you through uh, this pipeline. Uh, so it basically has uh, a MongoDB connection string uh, as as part of your CI CD to uh, run your integration test. And it has two stages one is test and one is deploy. Uh, and we're obviously bringing the Mongo service from the GitLab, uh, which GitLab provides. And we run uh, these uh, four scripts. One is the NPM CI, which installs all the dependencies for uh, the project. And uh, NPM run CY, this is something that uh, Cypress, the test suite uh, that's used by this project, uh, uh, verifies its dependencies. And we have a run script. This run script basically brings up, uh, runs the NPM start and brings up the server, and uh, the, uh, which is basically in a background uh, process. And you run the test suite. So this, uh, there's nothing unusual about this. This is a standard out of the box, uh, which is provided by NodeGoat. Then what we've added over here for uh, demo purposes is deploying it to a Heroku environment. 
uh, I've actually gone ahead and done this uh, deployment. So I can just show you this. So I have an app called uh, Nodeboard. And if I open this, uh, I should be able to see the application running. So there's no de facto uh, at this point. This is the standard Nodeboard application deployed on Heroku. And you see it uh, come up and I can log in. And you see it's functional. Now what I'm going to do is uh, show you how easy it is to actually instrument it or add deep factor into uh, this pipeline so that uh, we get real time uh, observability uh, about any AppSec violations. So uh, I have a pre-configured uh, script. I'm going to run you through that as well. So Darshan, as I see through this, it looks like a very standard way of uh, integrating uh, into the uh, into the GitHub pipeline, right? You you run your application, you start your automation suite, and then you, if required, you deploy it on whether it's Heroku or AWS or whatever environment that the customer is in. Uh, yeah. So this looks like a very standard uh, GitHub pipeline, right? GitLab pipeline. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, bringing that up uh, with us. Actually, let me just go ahead and show that uh, pipeline to you. I've already run this, uh, the standard pipeline. And if I go into the GitLab's pipeline uh, dashboard, I should be able to see the test and the deploy stage. And if I go into the test uh, stage, I see a whole bunch of these integration tests that have been run. So this is a good point to actually uh, uh, connect Deep Factor so that Deep Factor can gather insights as these tests are run. So uh, yeah, now that we have that, let me uh, add the updated configuration. So this is the updated configuration. What you see over here is uh, the first line is basically in including the de facto GitLab template. So this is where we kind of give helper uh, uh, functions to be able to, uh, it, these are basically uh, uh, to ease the integration uh, into your pipeline. Uh, so the updated pipeline now consists of the old test. Uh, then we have the deploy. And then we have two additional uh, uh, stages, which are basically the web scan and the de facto report. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at the testing stage. Uh, since we're going to ho be hooking into uh, the de facto at the stage itself. So everything else remains exactly the same. Uh, there's nothing that's changed except for this one line where we add the uh, DF cuttle runtime, uh, the CLI and you pass an application name and a component name and a version and the command to actually execute this. And uh, everything else remains the same. So, and you continue to run your uh, Cypress uh, test suite against the uh, instrumented uh, application test. So, so all that's changed is the launch command instead of uh, saying node something, you do instead of the command. Yeah, instead of just the run.sh, we now have uh, the DF cuttle and uh, a command parameter, right. which takes so the run command. It's as easy as, as, easy as replacing your uh, execute command and just replacing yeah. it with DFCTL run. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there is a before script. This is basically to install the DF cuttle into your uh, the container in which you're executing this. Uh, and we have the deploy to staging, which nothing has changed. And we have the uh, web scan. Uh, the configuration for the scan is something that we set up through the variables. Uh, so if you look at this, we've set up the application name, which is GitLab hyphen demo and then component and version. Uh, and we also need to specify the host of our uh, T factor uh, instance that's running. I have already gone ahead and done that. This is running on EC, uh, AWS EC2. Uh, so I have a, a valid instance running. So uh, as we 
do this, uh, there are a couple of other uh, API keys that we need to add in uh, to basically uh, for the deep factor, uh, uh, the DF cutter to be able to uh, recognize where the telemetry needs to be sent and uh, the reports to be generated. So I'm going to show that to you next. So, uh, so let's just save this first, and then I'm going to and I'm going to push this into. Uh, GitLab, and you should be able to see the pipeline kicking off. And if you see the updated uh, pipeline, you'd now see the test, deploy, and the new de facto web scan and the de facto report stages. Uh, so, in the meantime, while it's running, uh, let me just show you some of the uh, configurations that we need to do. So, uh, we basically need one, the API token that needs to be used inside uh, GitLab. So you can go ahead and create new as many tokens as you want, and they can be uh, revoked as well by deleting these. Uh, so that is one token, and we basically set that up in your CI settings through the variables. So we can actually set these uh, tokens over here. Now, if I go back to the pipeline, you'd actually see uh, the application being brought up and it wouldn't uh, be any different from without the factor. So it would execute exactly the same way and you'd have uh, the test executed uh, at this test stage. Uh, so this is something that normally takes about seven to eight minutes, the end-to-end uh, -end test itself. In the meantime, I can what I can do is actually show you a previously run uh, stage. So if you see this, uh, all these four stages have actually completed. And the final stage is basically the de facto report. And you would see, you could go into the artifacts and you'd have uh, the completed reports that are generated by de facto. So you have a summary uh, report that's actually uh, added as artifacts to your uh, job itself uh, for each pipeline. So you have a record of what uh, what are all the vulnerabilities that were detected and all the issues that de facto discovered. And all these are linked back to the de facto portal itself. If you see some of these dust alerts that we've detected. You'd see uh, the request. This is something that Vikaso already showed you. Uh, you have uh, the complete path, and uh, you have a confidence of the uh, the alert that's been generated. Another cool thing that we do have over here is basically the request and response that uh, we actually captured for this vulnerability. So you could uh, take a look at all the headers, and then you could see the response that came. And uh, if you want to try it out, you could actually get the curl command and you could copy it and then paste it in your command line and uh, you'd, you'd be able to reproduce the exact uh, vulnerability that you show. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we have a couple of other things as well. Uh, let me uh, now show you the other workflow which I was talking about. Uh, which is the containerized uh, workflow. So I have a separate project for that. Uh, this is called the node code Docker. Uh, and this is pretty much exactly the same project, except the pipeline is slightly different. Uh, so the node code project comes with a Docker file. Uh, 
uh, it's it's a fairly standard uh, Docker file where they're basically installing the uh, dependencies and then copying over the node modules and then doing an npm start end of it. Uh, so uh, as part of this standard pipeline, uh, what we do uh, is do a Docker build and then we push it to the Heroku registry and uh, that's about it and it get de gets deployed. So I've gone ahead and done that as well uh, because these are obviously some uh, something that needs to be done before. Uh, so if you see this, oh sorry, I think I just opened the same thing again. The ng container. So this is the application that's uh, the that's using the container workflow. And to start off, it's the exact same uh, application, but it's deployed as a container itself. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, and you can see that this is a completely functional uh, web application that connects to a Mongo backend. Uh, so let me go ahead and edit uh, the container workflow. So this is the new workflow with the de facto uh, added to it. Uh, so similar to the previous workflow, we actually have uh, to include the de facto template. It's the same template file. Uh, and uh, since it's a containerized workflow, we actually build it inside Docker. This is a uh, Docker and Docker uh, uh, container in which it executes. And uh, we have the similar configurations, except that the scan URL where uh, we run the scan against is is different. This is the containerized uh, deployment, and the three stages. One is the build, and the next is the web scan and the report. Uh, so if you see over here, this is slightly uh, different in that we actually have specific Docker files uh, that are uh, created for this uh, container. So we actually run uh, the force script to actually download these docker files and you you build your uh, the actual docker file into uh, an application and you run a secondary build where you pass the previously generated uh, docker image so this actually ends up creating a contain uh, instrumented container which is basically a, uh, which has the factor instrumentation inside it and uh, besides this everything else is the standard uh, uh, is from the standard pipeline where we have uh, to log into the heroku registry and then uh, we basically push it to the registry and i'd like we... to make a quick yeah, sorry to uh, uh, keep yeah go ahead button, but i'd like to make a quick point here what we uh, noticed was there were two kinds of uh, customers that we spoke to uh, one wanted to uh, add the factor in the in the build pipeline, whereas the other ones wanted to add defector in the deployment stage. So for Docker, we actually have two different ways of adding defector. Version is uh, right now domain one of them where you actually create a new image out of your Docker image, which has defector baked in. So you just run this new image the same way you would run your original image. No change to your deployment, but you there is a change to your build step. We do also support a DFCTL run a single command deploy with the pattern, and you use the original image as is, right? So we uh, we provide two different ways. Uh, we meet the customer where, where he is, right? So yeah, thanks for bringing that up with us. Uh, that's right. We have multiple ways of actually instrumenting application. You could choose to run any way uh, that suits you. Uh, this is just an example workflow where we are actually building another image and then pushing the image across to uh, uh, a deploy de deployment. Uh, 
So uh, the Docker run that Vikas mentioned would also be useful in the uh, in the case that uh, you actually run integration tests on your container itself, which is uh, run on say GitLab. Uh, so the only reason we chose to rebuild the uh, original image in this case is because uh, the new image is what gets deployed uh, to uh, wherever you choose to deploy your application. So uh, yeah, coming back to the pipeline, we have again the defactor scan and the defactor report. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention earlier was that uh, this this stage is something that is delayed. Uh, if you look at this, this is about 40 minutes uh, post uh, running your uh, application and your scan. This is mostly to kind of uh, handle the delay in uh, running a complete scan uh, these dash scans are something uh, something that takes uh, it, it takes a non-deterministic amount of time uh, so that's the reason we kind of come up with a baseline number of the amount of time it takes to actually complete the scan and uh, you can configure this uh, according to the time it takes to uh, run a scan against your application there are also several other options, the scan strength, and then uh, where you can, right now it's configured for low, you could set a medium or a high, and you could also do an API scan. Uh, assuming you, your application exposes uh, an API and you have, uh, uh, say, a Swagger documentation for that, you could actually uh, configure it to hit, uh, do an API scan as well. That's something that's supported. And we also support like form-based authentication because uh, we could actually specify all the parameters needed for uh, logging into your application as well. So your test could, uh, your dash scan could be more comprehensive. So, yeah, uh, a lot of these are documented in our uh, documentation. You can just head over to docs.defactor.io and go into GitLab. And you'd see uh, the different options that are available as well as how to get your different keys and then configure, uh, yeah, configure your pipelines. Uh, There's also one thing I did not mention was where do you get the de facto GitLab the, the CI YAML file. This is something that's available from uh, the docs. Uh, you could just curl and get this and you probably check this in, into your source code itself. Uh, so this sits along with your uh, uh, GitLab CI YAML. So you'd also see your Git de facto CI YAML file. This is the complete template for uh, which, which is uh, basically uh, how we support all the different uh, jobs and stages. Uh, so let me just run this as well. Just wanted to check if the, so if you go back to your dashboard, you see now that the GitLab demo application has been created. And if I go into the pipelines, it's still running. So it's, it's run the test and it's actually done a deploy deployment to Heroku. And it should have triggered a task scan as well. Yeah. So if you come back to your portal and go into GitLab demo, this is the application that we configured. You start seeing uh, vulnerabilities that we've detected already. So head over to the web services and then this is the port against which we ran the scan. And you see that a scan has actually started. So uh, I'm not gonna let this complete because this is something that's gonna take quite some time to uh, complete. Uh, I'm assuming it's uh, based on uh, the previous run, I think it takes about 30 to 40 minutes. So uh, what I'll do is I'm going to stop the scan and uh, show you the containerized workflow as well. And then take it from there. 
Yes. So after this, I'm going to go ahead and So uh, the scan time actually depends on the kind of application you're running, how many URIs we were able to crawl. So it's a dynamic uh, time that's dependent on your application. And also the scan strength, which uh, Darshan mentioned, you can decide to do a high strength scan. So it will increase the number of attacks. Uh, so you get a full coverage, but that also increases your scan time. So you can tweak them based on, so for daily bills, you can look at a medium or a low, scan, uh, low uh, strength. For, for your weekly scans, you can you can look at high or medium, right? So you have that configurability, uh, which you can quickly set using that uh, variable that Darshan showed. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, another thing is uh, the way we think uh, deep factor, at least these containerized, uh, at least these uh, deep factorized pipelines should be run is you could probably have them running. Uh, as a daily job on your uh, the main branch that you work uh, so that you run a scan and uh, you generate a report on a daily basis. So every time there is a new version that is created and a new version of the report. So you could actually uh, monitor those and if needed, you can actually stage, uh, get these builds as well. So if you say that uh, if there are more uh, uh, T4 alerts, then get this build and the build would automatically fail and alert the, uh, the people. So uh, let me go back to the other pipeline. This is the node for Docker project and let's go into the pipeline and this should have triggered. Yeah. So if you see, this was my comment message and I have a new pipeline that started. So this is the Docker build stage, then you have a, a web scan. Yeah, I should have probably named this better. It should be called build and deploy. Oh, I think we did have some problem. I think I know what the problem is. Yeah. It is almost always a white space problem. Yeah. Well, hey, it proves to the audience that we're live. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so let's go back to the pipeline. Yeah, like you said, yeah, we're not faking it. We're actually showing a pipeline in progress. And this is so cool about uh, CI, right? You just do a commit and the pipeline is automatically launched. And once you add defector, you have continuous observability baked into your CI pipeline. That's the true promise of continuous observability. Uh, let's go back to our portal itself. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, this takes a few minutes to actually uh, execute and it kind of varies depending on, uh, yeah, when GitLab chooses to schedule your while you wait for this session, uh, do you want to show the audience the start scan form uh, so they get a sense of the kind of uh, configurability they have? Right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so you technically, yeah, I was just waiting for the other instance to come up. Yeah. Um, so we, okay. You could still sh show them the form so uh, they understand you know, how to launch it yeah. from the UI. But so, once we yeah. get into the CCD pipeline, they don't need to bother about the UI as well. Yeah, so the exact same options are uh, obviously the easier to work with in the UI. Uh, so you can actually select a web service. Uh, web services are something that de facto automatically recognizes. 
So if your application exposes some kind of a web interface, we actually detect that and we're able to run scans against those as well. So these are uh, uh, all the same options, except uh, it's from our portal itself. You could trigger scans over here and you have uh, all the different options. Uh, like what I told you earlier, uh, say you your application uses some kind of form-based authentication. Uh, so you could specify the login URI and the scan username, password, and the form data that is used. Uh, these are all uh, standard options uh, to do any dash scans. And what I'd like to highlight here is we provide all of these APIs as observability as code. So you could integrate our APIs in, in any of your automation or your or CI pipeline, and you could you could start scans in an automated yeah. fashion. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Vikas. Actually, uh, the entire bunch of APIs that we expose are available for every deployment of P Factor. So you could just uh, go into the API section in, inside your deployment and you'll see the entire Swagger documents, uh, documentation for the APIs. So uh, you'd be able to do pretty much everything that's there in the UI uh, through, the, through our APIs, which means that you can actually integrate uh, all of the functionality into your CI/CD pipelines. So if you see now, uh, you see that there's a new active instance that's come up. Uh, this is the dockerized version of it. Uh, and if I go into Heroku, I'd see that, yeah, there's a new deployment that's come up. So I can open the app and it would function exactly the way it previously did, except that this is an instrumented uh, version of our application without uh, having to change a single line of code in the actual source code. And this is also sending telemetry right to us, uh, to the de facto portal. Let me just show you that it's actually doing the scan. So you can see this, uh, the scan has just started off on this. And in the meantime, if you go into network tabs, uh, you can actually see all the connections coming into the application as well as outgoing connections. So these are basically to the MongoDB uh, instance that I've set up on uh, Atlas. If you look at this, uh, uh, this cluster, which is running on AWS, uh, the application is actually connecting to these. I'm glad you showed the screen, Dushan. Uh, this... Uh, shows the kind of powerful metrics that we also expose along with our uh, alerts. So if you want to see what's happening under the hood in your application, you can just click a component and see network activity, process activity, file system activity. So a whole, whole lot of metrics uh, that we collect uh, from your running application. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so while the scan is ongoing, uh, let me show you uh, from a previous pipeline that uh, I executed a couple of hours earlier. You see this. Uh, yeah, another thing I uh, didn't mention was that we actually integrate into the security and compliance dashboard of GitLab. So if you go into your security dashboard, you'd actually see all the vulnerabilities that P factor is detected. See a complete vulnerability report. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, uh, if assuming uh, you are someone who, who works out of GitLab as in raise issues and triage on issues in GitLab itself, we actually uh, send all these vulnerabilities to the GitLab dashboard itself. So you could triage with your developers uh, right from GitLab. So if you see this, we've 
we have de facto has the task and the dependency scanning. So we see these are uh, the dependencies that we detected as vulnerable. You could navigate onto these. And yeah, find these issues as well. And these are linked back to the portal itself. Uh, you could, there are several workflows inside DeFact itself. Like you could raise a Jira for this, uh, assign it to people, uh, assign it to your team members, uh, things like that. So yeah, we have, uh, if you look at this, all the CVs associated with this vulnerabilities, the vulnerability that we detected. This is in NPM 3.1, uh, 3.10. And uh, they are, uh, these are all the list of CVs that we detected. And we also give a, a part of where this package was uh, found uh, in your project. So this is obviously uh, something that's added as a dependency to your project. Yeah, uh, another thing is you could see the uh, dash alerts as well. You look at this, there's 17 high uh, high priority uh, vulnerabilities that we did detect. The cross-site scripting, anti-CSR tokens, uh, uh, wildcard directives, all of these. And you'd, you'd find a similar report in uh, the alert screen in the application as well from the de facto dashboard. Yeah, uh, anything else? Anything else, Vikas, you want me to uh, highlight and show? I think uh, this was great. Uh, uh, what I liked about our integration here is that uh, it's tightly uh, integrated into GitLab. So we even, you know, put all, all, the, all our findings in your, in your GitLab security dashboard. So if that's the tool of your choice, you can triage it from there. Uh, but if you're not tied to uh, uh, GitLab security dashboard, you can always come to our alert scheme and uh, triage all the alerts uh, from the de facto portal. Uh, I think that was a good, good comprehensive uh, demo. Thank you. Uh, okay, then I guess that's it from me. And that concludes our demo. I'll hand it back to Amy. So now we're gonna move into our Q and A. And we've actually had a question come in. So let me read that to you guys. I saw a Docker app in the demo. Does Deep Factor also support Kubernetes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Kubernetes is the go-to uh, way of deploying uh, cloud applications these days, right? Uh, and, and, and it's great, uh, the kind of uh, functionalities that Kubernetes provide. And we, were, uh, we are very proactive with our uh, Kubernetes approach. We provide uh, admission web controller that seamlessly integrates into your Kubernetes deployment. And, and it adds de facto to all the pods that you desire and, and observes all your pods. I'm guessing that it was um, harder to show that in a demo. Uh, and that's why Darshan probably skipped it, but uh, we, we completely support Kubernetes. Okay. The other question that came in early was about how long it takes to complete a scan, but Vikas, I think that you addressed that um, thoroughly as Darshan was going through it. Right, so yeah. basically uh, it depends on the application, uh, just to reiterate, it depends on the application, the number of URIs that were, uh, that were crawled. Uh, and we also provide you a, a lever where you can pick the kind of attacks you want, low, medium, high, uh, and that would, uh, that way you can balance the time taken versus the number of attacks and hence the comprehensive uh, comprehensiveness of the test. Got it. Darshan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think Vikas pretty much covered everything. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, we have a whole bunch of these uh, knobs through which you can actually control uh, how much, uh, yeah, uh, how deep the scan should be. So and, uh, and another point, and, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And another point, uh, I think, uh, uh, which I uh, should highlight is that DAST is just one of the insights that we provide. 
if you look at the kind of insights that Darshan uh, showed through the demo, we showed vulnerable dependencies, vulnerable OS packages, test, uh, uh, system call risk, AppSec violations, right? So basically we are very comprehensive security tool uh, that gives you uh, complete uh, visibility into, into your security poster. Okay, that looks like all of the questions we're gonna have today. I definitely want to thank our speakers for joining. I know it's very late over there in India and I'd like the audience, thank you for your time and please engage with us. You can request a demo. We'd be delighted, delighted to show you in a one-on-one -on -one format. You can send us an email at demo at deepfactor.io. We've also got uh, our sandbox that you can play in on our home screen. You can scroll down on our homepage and find that. And then lastly, you can check out our customer videos. So you don't have to just take our word for it. You'll see testimonials from Comprise, Jobvite, and Cadent. And with that, again, thank you everybody for your time. All of the registrants will receive a copy of this recording and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.